I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, I don't want to wait too long. Well, thank you everybody for being here. This is super exciting. Um, and especially on like a Sunday morning. Um, and I'm excited for all of us to um, uh, learn more about growing CBD hemp plants in our gardens. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking to Emily Gogol, uh, creator of Grow It From Home. Um, and just for a little background, uh, my name is Gabby Villasenor and I work in the Home Gardens program uh, at Growing Gardens. And uh, what we do is uh, provide vegetable gardens for families and individuals with uh, limited resources all over Portland, Milwaukee, um, Clackamas. And um, I'm really excited to have Emily here because um, I know from hearing about from your per, like personal stories and from my own personal history on um, how effective CBD can be um, medicinally. Um, it's just such an amazing plant. And, um, and I think this knowledge sharing is like super important for our community. And so I'm really excited to have um, Emily here to, um, to help us uh, grow it from home. So, um, so yeah, um, a little bit about Emily. Uh, Emily Gogol is the founder and CEO of Infinite Tree. Um, a nationally recognized hemp nursery. Um, Infinite Tree just launched their retail brand, which is Grow It From Home, uh, bringing CBD hemp plants to folks across the US. Um, Emily is also passionate about growing the next generation of hemp plants and loves sharing all of the uh, photos of home grows on Grow It From Home's Instagram. Um, so there's so much to share and um, I'm super excited to have her here with us and I'm gonna uh, stop sharing the screen and send it over to you. Hey everyone, good morning. Thank you so much, Gabby. Yeah, and I'll just, I guess, add to that, that um, as we go into the talk, there are, please ask as many questions as you guys want. I'm gonna start off the talk by giving kind of an overview on growing uh, cannabis at home. And then we're gonna have a large Q and A. But if you have a question while I'm chatting, definitely use the, the chat box and record it there or feel free to, to jump in and ask me a question. So um, I've, heard, I've heard it all <laughs> in relation to cannabis before and I'm really here to answer your questions and to help everyone really the main, you know, on our, I, I say it a lot, but it really grows. It's just like a tomato. It's just like growing a tomato. Um, the only real difference is it's legal status in our country. Otherwise it's a plant that you can eat, um, that you can dry, that you can smoke, that you can juice. It's an annual, it's an herb, it's a flower, it's a vegetable. I mean, it's just like uh, many other plants in your garden and you grow it just the same outdoors. So um, feel free to ask me questions and I'll just get started with the basics of, of growing cannabis, which I bet uh, everyone here as gardeners, if, if some of you have already been doing your own garden, it's going to sound really familiar. And you, I hope you're going to be like, wow, that sounds exactly like growing a tomato. That was really reassuring because it, it really is. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so I work primarily with commercial farmers, so I can kind of give you like that background but before I started um, Infinite Tree in Southern Oregon I lived in San Francisco and I worked as a scientist but as a volunteer I started nonprofits that built public parks so I have a lot of history working with community gardens um, and gardeners so I have that perspective on it as well being both an at-home gardener in an urban environment in San Francisco for more than a decade and then now running a commercial farm and working with commercial farmers so um, feel free to ask me questions like on both sides. Okay, so um, again, it's like it's a plant, just like any other plant in your garden, except where you purchase it um, is a little tricky because it is cannabis. And I just want to show you, um, I have a little baby plant here in a four inch pot. So totally normal looking, nothing magical, except that it's cannabis, I guess, for some folks. But basically, it's a very herbaceous vegetative plant. It, you can bend it. You know, it has like a lot of resilience in its stems. It has very large leaves for um, which, as you can imagine, just like other plants that have very large leaves like this, it likes full sun. So when you think about growing this plant in your garden, and I'm going to use because we're all gardeners here, I'm going to use the term cannabis. So cannabis is the botanical name this plant. 
Um, but the plants that you can purchase from me are CBD, which means legally this is a hemp plant. Um, so legally this is called hemp, but botanically it's cannabis. So I'm gonna to refer to it as cannabis today because everything I say botanically fits cannabis as a genus. Um, all the legal stuff we're not going to get into today. So we're just gardeners talking about plants. Okay. It's a tomato. So um, these plants like full sun and you would situate them in your garden, just like you would a tomato plant. So with that being said, one of the important things about growing this type of annual at home is to situate it in full sun and in, you know, my experience as an at-home gardener and working with other folks in the industry, we do the same thing on the commercial side as I recommend that you do as a back home, a backyard gardener. Amend your soil before your plants go in. We've all been there where we forget to put in our bone meal and our bat guano and, and check and add our compost layer. And then our tomatoes don't do very well that year, right? It's no different with cannabis. So before you put your plants in the ground, whether they're in the ground or in a container, which I'll get to, amend your soil. Start off with either a high quality potting mix in, your, on, in a container or in the ground, start out with you know, really great garden soil that you've amended or add compost, bat guano, bone meal as needed, just like you would for another high feeding crop like tomatoes. Again, it's like growing a tomato plant. So I really recommend prepping your soil first. So prep your soil and make sure it's in full sun, just like you would put a tomato plant in full sun, put a cannabis plant in full sun. Um, related to that, maybe some of you have heard things like, oh, but cannabis has all these special micronutrient requirements. I've got to feed it all these special elixirs throughout the season. I've got to make a tea, a compost tea for it. On a commercial scale, we don't do that. We don't do it. We amend our soil and we let the plants go for the summer. And in a backyard garden, I recommend the same thing. If you wouldn't fertigate or add additional amendments to your tomatoes, don't do it for your cannabis. Um, it's really make the soil complete and well fed before you put your plants in. And then just plain water is totally fine for the rest of the season. Um, when you go online, you'll see a lot of people trying to sell you special micronutrients, special fungus and bacterial preparations, teas, microbiological tea. Oh, it looks like we're losing you a little bit. You there, Emily? Uh, feel free if you want to turn off your video, um, Emily, because it's um, cutting out a bit. That might help. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Somehow I got I got dropped. No worries. <laughs> uh, no worries. Okay, remember everyone, you can jump in with questions too. So definitely flag me. Um, and, oh, and feel free if it gets choppy, feel free to turn off your video if needed. Okay, no, it just like dropped all of a sudden. I was like, oh, well. Wow. Yeah, um, so basically, again, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't fertigate or compost tea or special, you know, additives to your tomato plants, don't do it for your cannabis plants either. Okay, they will grow great in your normal vegetable garden with a properly prepared soil. So just to summarize for everyone, full sun, just like a tomato plant, and the same type of soil preparation and amending that you do in your vegetable garden to get it ready for heavy feeders like tomatoes um, in the spring, same for cannabis. Uh, one thing to know about putting a cannabis plant in your garden is that they do get, they can get quite large. So the plant from grow it from home, um, come typically as a four incher like this, but throughout the growing season, they can get up to about five feet tall and three to four feet wide. So it's a really big bushy plant. And I will get into later in the talk about how you can prune your plant in July. It loves to be pruned and you can shape it 
uh, to be as small as you want really in the month of July. Uh, and that kind of sets the, the space for it. So when you put it in the garden, if you're gonna let it grow to full size when you, when you situate it in your garden, do give it like a nice four to five foot, you know, it takes up a big space. Think like a really big, um, if you were growing a, you know, a collection of big bushy uh, dahlias, you know, like you would give them some airflow and you'd give them some space between the dahlia plants. It's the same for cannabis. Give it some space, give it four feet wide. Um, it's a little happier that way. It's just going to get big, but you can always cut it back. So I don't worry. I don't worry too much about, but just saying it is a rather big, it can be a rather big plant. So um, I've just talked a little bit about amending your soil and about putting it in your garden. Now let's talk about growing it on your patio or in a container. So reasons that people grow on a patio or in a container, it's where full sun is. Great, full sun, perfect. Um, they wanna move their plants around. Maybe they've got a, you know, they wanna be able to pick up the plant and take it somewhere else while they have folks over or, you know, an activity or whatever in their, on their patio. Containers are great. Um, what's really nice about cannabis, similar again to tomatoes, the smaller the container your plant is in, the smaller the final plant will be. So you can control plant size by the container size. I don't recommend going too small. Um, I have an example of a fabric pot here. I believe this is a three gallon fabric pot. I really recommend, three gallon is fine. You'll wanna prune back your plant a bit if it's in three gallons. I recommend more like a five gallon fabric pot. And there's actually a photo of me on our website or Instagram, I believe, where I'm holding a big, beautiful, bushy plant that's in a five gallon fabric pot. And it's like super happy. So five gallons is really um, a, a good thing. And this is a fabric pot. Um, cannabis does really well. It likes warm roots. So black fabric is good. It also doesn't like to be um, overwatered, just like your tomatoes. When you overwater your tomatoes, they suffer. They don't do as well. Um, same with cannabis. So fabric pots are good if you're going to keep on top of watering them because they are going to dry out more quickly than in a terracotta pot or in the ground. But they're also nice for being able to, you know, you've got these handles, you can move the, the, the plant around on your patio and you can position it in full sun um, and it keeps the plant small. So growing cannabis in a small, you know, a five gallon uh, fabric pot or terracotta pot or even plastic is totally fine. You don't need anything special. Um, and it does really well in containers, to be completely honest. Just start with a high quality, fresh potting soil. So brand new, great potting soil is best. Um, and then the other thing to note in uh, containers, yeah, I would just say you'll have to water them a bit more um, than your plants in the ground, just like you would if you're growing a tomato plant in a container but they do tolerate drying out really well. Um, commercially, we say that the soil should be below 50% water saturation before watering. That means really dry. <laughs> it means like your soil should not have a lot of water in it before you, uh, before you water again. And we recommend watering deeply. So doing like a heavy soak less frequently. Cannabis does much better with that. I'm not gonna call it a, a zero escape or water wise plant because it's still a big herbaceous vegetative plant that does require water, but you really should space out your waterings um, and water deeply when you do water. Um, okay, I think I'll go on to the next. Let's see if there's maybe, I saw a bunch of stuff come in there's the chat. There's one in the chat, yeah. Yeah, I'll pull it up. Um, okay, first one is, where do you get bat poop? Yeah, so bat guano, um, any nursery supply in Portland should have bat guano. And they'll be happy to talk to you about how you should add it, you know, to your soil and mix it in. Um, it's a little stinky. If you have a dog, your dog might be into it, uh, but it's a great product for amending your soil. Um, in the chat, um, yeah. And then if you prune in July, when do you plant a baby six inch plant? How can you control the size of the plant if you do garden bed? Okay, great. Well, I will, um, I will get to pruning. I want to cover watering a little bit more. Um, so when you do water your cannabis, um, but I will get to pruning in a second, everyone. Um, when you do water your cannabis, it does have, you know, you can see like all these big, big leaves. Um, 
overhead watering is not best. You don't need to like rinse the plant. It's, um, it's not like citrus that kind of likes that. Um, you really just want to water the roots of the plant. So people use drip irrigation or they just put their hose, you know, next to their plant. Um, so you really just want to water the roots for cannabis and water deeply and thoroughly, especially as you get later into the season, you know, in Portland, it starts getting, it can get a little wet in September and a little humid. Um, when the plants start putting on their flower, let's say like, Anyone ever grown dahlias okay, in Portland or, or, you know, dahlias are like a really common plant. Probably, I know, I have to, yeah. So you wouldn't water your dahlia flowers, right? Like when they're putting on all those big, beautiful, colorful dahlia blossoms, you wouldn't like hit the blossom with the hose, right? Because that water is going to get into that dahlia blossom and it's going to be a great place for, for fungal and bacterial diseases to start. And then you're, you're going to lose your flower, right? It's going to go, go really quickly. It's the same with cannabis. So when you water, and especially it starts putting on flowers in August into September, water the roots because you don't want to water those flowers. You wouldn't water your dahlia flowers. So don't water your cannabis flowers. It's the same thing. Um, people get a little weird about cannabis flowers because I think because of its illegal past um, and it's kind of a different looking flower for most folks, but it's no different in a sense than when you grow salvia or agastache or dahlias for their flowers, you know, um, just don't water, don't water the flowers. And you really can't go wrong if you don't water the flowers. Um, okay, so that, those are my questions on watering. Uh, and if you guys have questions on watering, um, definitely put them in the chat. Um, so now we can talk about pruning. So, there's a lot of misinformation about trellising and pruning regarding cannabis on the internet. So I really recommend, um, there's a book that I recommend to everyone. It's called Growing Weed in the Garden. It's by Joanna Silver. It's a very easy to read book um, and it goes through the basics pretty much, you know, it's more expanded like in detail than what I'm talking about today, but um, it goes through sort of like debunks a lot of myths about growing cannabis at home. And it's a really easy to read garden book. So I highly recommend growing weed in the garden. And she has a whole section on trellising and pruning. And the takeaway, which I completely agree with is you don't need to do it. People want to sell you all of these. They talk about sea of green and scrog gardening and like special bi manifold pruning techniques this is all legacy stuff from basement growers, from people growing indoors in a small, I mean, imagine trying to grow a tomato plant in your closet. It would be terrible, right? How would you watering it, the lighting, um, it's in a small, small container. So you just gotta constantly feed it because it doesn't have enough soil. You're pruning it because mold is a big issue because you're growing in your closet. So you're like taking the leaves off and you're pruning it this very special way to try and get the maximum set of tomatoes because it's growing a tomato in your closet. So that sounds crazy, right? Well, that's how cannabis was grown for a really long time in this country. And because of that, there's a lot of people who think we should continue with those methods, both indoors and outside. So you do not feel pressured to do that um, commercially. Farmers do not trellis their hemp plants. So I'll say it again. Commercially, we do not prune. We do not trellis. We do not fertigate in mid-season. And these are commercial farmers growing it for their income. And they produce award-winning craft flour that sells at the highest price point on the market. And they don't do any of that stuff. So they start with good soil. They start with great plants, you know, really disease-resistant agronomically correct varieties of plant, like what we provide from Grow It From Home. Um, and they do great, they don't have to do a lot of stuff. So when you grow cannabis at home, if you have a tomato cage around that you really like and you wanna trellis your cannabis just to make, you think it looks better or you think it'll help you have a high wind area, maybe you're in a really windy patio, put a tomato cage down. It will be no worse for it. It might even do better, especially if you're in high wind. 
if you're in a high wind area in Portland or like on a second story on a patio, put down a, a tomato cage. It'll, it'll like to have the support. It'll, it'll grow up through it. It'll be really nice. But do you have to invest in expensive trellising setups and like prune and do all this fancy stuff with your vegetative plants? No, you do not. It will produce so much flower without any help from you basically after you put it in the ground and water it. So um, that's the first thing, trellising and pruning just to get shape. Don't worry about it, like for flower yield. Um, so now talking about pruning to control plant size. Um, trying to think of a really good example. Um, I'll, I'll have to think about it, but basically cannabis before it goes into flower, which it doesn't go into flower until like August. So as long as you're pruning your plant in July, don't worry about it. You can basically bonsai your plants. I mean, you can cut them back as hard as you want in July and they're gonna like flower off of all of those cuts. So they're really forgiving. Like I said, it's a very herby, you know, vegetative plant. It's, it's got very nice, it's like a salvia in a sense. It's got really big, like um, the nodes are very easy to see. It's got really flexible, sturdy branching. Um, so when you go in there to prune, like you would prune anything, whether it's a hydrangea or a camellia or your dahlias back, um, you know, cut just above a growing node, like you would with clean, clean pruners like normal and shape it, shape it to what you want. If you wanna keep the plant three feet by three feet, cut it back to two and a half feet by two and a half feet. You can, it's, it's apically dominant typically. So you can always cut the most apically dominant um, branch going up. So topping it, you can top it is what I'm saying. And then that will help it bush out this way. And you can take all that side bush off as well and make it, you know, make it the footprint a little bit smaller than the footprint you want. And then as it goes into August, it'll put on a little more vegetative growth. So it'll fill back in nicely. And that new vegetative growth will have all your flowers happening. So if you cut it back, like I, I like to say, you know, 4th of July, week or so after 4th of July, cut back your plants to what you want. And then that way, when they go, they get a little more vegetative growth in July, August, they start flowering. Um, it keeps the size down but you by no means have to do that. You can just let it get big and it will be fine. It's not, don't worry about, at least if you get plants from us, um, you don't have to worry about branches breaking. So, you know, like some folks, peonies are a good example. Peonies are in season right now in Portland. Some people have peony varieties where the blossoms are so big and the branches are so floppy and weak, you have to like stake up your peonies, right? There are some varieties of cannabis that are like that. Uh, I don't sell those varieties of cannabis. Commercial farmers don't want to grow those varieties of cannabis anymore. And I don't recommend them to backyard gardeners. But if you, you know, get some seeds from a THC like dispensary, they might recommend trellising or staking your flowers as they get larger because the plants are wimpy and they sag because they're not quality plants. Um, and they've got the flowers that will droop just like a peony. So it is variety specific, but the industry is moving away from those varieties. Now that we have, you know, a legitimate market and we're breeding and we're selecting and we're, we're producing, you know, better plants for everyone. So those are kind of like the old school black market um, varieties. And I'm not saying don't grow them if you get your hand, like they have some interesting qualities. I'm just saying we stake up peonies for a reason, some varieties, and there's some varieties of cannabis because of their sort of legacy stuff. Like they might droop and be kind of wimpy, but we'll have beautiful flowers. Um, so you might need to stake those up. But if you buy plants from me, um, they're all very hardy commercial varieties that you do not need to stake and we'll have beautiful heavy flower production and you won't need to stake. Um, again, if you're in a high wind area, especially on a patio, you might want to do a tomato cage just to give them an extra little bit of support, but you by no means have to. Um, so um, we have yeah. a couple questions in the chat. I just want to make sure we get to these. Um, 
So for Rebecca, if you're growing directly in the ground and we have rain, especially after flowering, how do we protect the flowers? And then we'll just we'll just go down to those. Yes, yeah. that's a great question, Rebecca. Um, so it depends on the time of the year. So, so basically, if you get rain like in August and early September and the flowers aren't mature yet, which they won't be, as long as you get some sunshine afterwards, same thing happens on our farm. Your flowers will dry out. They'll dry out and be fine. Don't worry about it. Um, if it's, you know, the last week in September and we get unseasonably wet weather, like a week of cold, damp rain, the last week of September, might want to harvest your plants early. I would just recommend harvesting your plants a little early um, and starting the drying process then so that they don't get moldy. But you know, we really, I don't see those problems at, in backyard gardens very much. It's really on the commercial scale that people have problems with mold. Um, but that's a great question. You can always throw a little tarp over your plants like you would protect any other flower in your garden, you know, throw um, a little tarp over it for that evening, you know, so the rain sheds off of it. Um, if it's gonna be a couple days in a row, rain and, and, and dark, you know, cool conditions that kind of help with um, bacterial and fungal growth, like just put a tarp over it like you would anything else. Um, but they do dry out. If you get a couple days of sunshine after a rainstorm, they dry out just fine. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. But I mean, I wouldn't say don't worry, but like, like any other plant, if you want to protect the flowers, throw a tarp over it. Um, frost is an issue. If you get a couple nights of unseasonal frost in late September, that will kill your plants. Just like a tomato plant, we get like a couple early frosts in September in Portland and everybody's tomatoes bite the dust, right? Or their dahlias. It's the same. So with cannabis, just like dahlias and tomatoes, um, if you're going to get frost, um, cover them cover them that night because they do not like the frost. Put some Christmas tree lights, the old school Christmas tree lights on them for heat, um, that kind of thing. But they can take a couple nights of light frost, but, uh, and, and actually our plants are more frost resistant than others. The variety victory that we provide to y'all um, through Grow From Home, it does really well against frost compared to some other varieties. But if you're growing again, stuff from like a dispensary it's probably going to be really intolerant of frost because it's mostly an indoor grown variety in the past. Um, so they're just going to go kaput in the frost. Um, okay, next question, Gabby. Yeah, um, and feel free if you were if you're still going through anything, we can hold questions till later, or we could just go through. No, no, them. let's do questions. Okay, cool. Next one was um, yeah. So companion planting. Are there plants that should or shouldn't be grown near them? Great question. Um, so first of all, not that much is known about like, you know, like the three sisters model of gardening. Like we don't have that for cannabis. There isn't like beans, corn, squash. Like we, that doesn't, you know, we don't have that kind of level of information for cannabis right now, but there's nothing, um, that I know of or have ever experienced or anecdotally heard from anyone about companion planting and cannabis. That's a problem. Like it, plenty of folks are growing it in the right in their vegetable garden next to basil and tomatoes. Um, a CBD plant next to a THC plant, great. Um, they don't like, I've had a question, people like, oh, well, if I grow CBD by THC, does it become THC? It's like, no, your red tomatoes don't become yellow tomatoes because you put them next to each other. <laughs> so it's okay. Maybe after they pollinate, they would, right? But if you put seed, that's one thing. But if you're just growing the tomatoes, they don't like, they don't influence each other. So you can companion plant them with what any, anything that looks good to you. Um, oh, there's some beautiful photos in actually in this book of home gardens, and state different garden setups. Oh my gosh, beautiful photos with people's cosmos, people's sunflowers, people's kale and their broccoli all next to their cannabis plants. So I think we might be losing you a little bit again. Um, if turning off your video works, that, that you can totally do that. Oh. I think she's gonna log back in. It just like turns off. Sorry, everybody. No um, problem. So I've seen it personally, and there is a beautiful book that details it in many people's gardens, growing with brassicas, with you know everything. So 
Um, whatever makes sense in your garden. A lot of people use cannabis to shade part of their garden because it's such a big, bushy, you know, tall plant. They'll use it to like catch the full sun and then provide some shade for like their lettuces or their, or their, their broccoli um, or their spinach in hotter areas. So it's, it's very useful because it gets big and bushy so fast. So you can use it as a screen to provide some shade, but companion planting, like whatever you want to put it next to, it loves being, you know, in, in a vegetable, a mixed garden situation. It does great. Well, some of the uh, next couple questions are kind of about um, where to buy the plants, where to find seeds, um, a good source for finding seeds if they want to propagate them themselves. Yeah. It's yeah. a good question. So uh, first of all, um, basically you're going to find a lot of online retailers selling you seed that's THC seed. Um, that's illegal, <laughs> first of all. Um, so you can purchase from them and they'll ship it to you. I'm just reminding everyone that it's currently not legal in this country to ship THC seed like that. So um, however, you can buy THC seed from a dispensary. So if you go to a dispensary in Portland, they may or may not have seed or clones available for you to purchase, but legally in Oregon, the only place you can buy THC containing plants, so marijuana is what it's legally classified as. Again, though, it's all cannabis, just has a different legal name, but it's the same plant. Everything I just said applies to the same, it's the same plant. Um, you go to the dispensary and you can buy seeds or a clone. They're typically quite expensive, um, upwards of $10 a seed or 20 to $35 for a, a very small plant um, that typically isn't as healthy as this. So don't be, I guess I'm just setting your expectations. It's not like going to Portland nursery and buying a beautiful new you know, marigold. Typically it's not like that. Um, that's part of why we're doing grow it from home because literally gardeners started calling me through my website, my commercial website. I was just helping farmers. Like I was running a commercial farming business. I mean, I still am, I should say, but um, backyard gardeners were calling me saying, I can't get plants or seeds. No one has them. And I don't want illegal things. I don't want THC. Can you send me hemp? I want CBD for my, for myself and my friends and family. And that's why I started growing from home because literally people called me. Um, and it turns out there's a huge need. Um, so on the seed side, they start the seed. We also were, we haven't launched this yet, but we are going to provide seeds for grow it from home. So you guys will be getting seeds. I actually, oh, I printed out. I have our seed packet here. So it's called victory hemp and it's CBD. It is easy to grow. And then it has the instructions on the back for how to plant it. So you'll notice this looks like any seed packet you've ever seen. And that's because it's seed like any other seed. It actually starts really easy. It's a bit, um, it's kind of like starting peas or beans. It's really good germination um, and it's a larger seed. Um, so you bury it a quarter inch down, um, but they start really easily. They just like heat as opposed to peas and beans. So it's pretty similar. So seed is a really good option. And we're gonna provide this to you guys at Growing Gardens. And then we're also gonna sell seed in our website soon. Um, and then right now you can also um, get clones, sometimes in a dispensary, THC clone. And then you can, we're gonna also hopefully provide plants to growing gardens as well of CBD next month. But you can also, for friends and family who aren't in the growing gardens program, if they wanna order plants, we ship plants, USD organic direct to your house. But we're the only people I know of that that we're the only ones doing it. So those are kind of my recommendations. It's a really new market and it's legally complicated right now. So it's hard for folks to enter the market. Whereas I have like 5 million different licenses and certifications to get all this to happen for you guys legally. Um, we'll get the questions. So yeah, source for seeds, um, a dispensary is the legal option. Online is the illegal option. Uh, and our website is a legal option as well. Um, if I buy a seed, how do I know it's female? That's a great question. So historically, people have bought what's called an unfeminized seed. Um, cannabis is dioecious. Um, it produces male and female plants. 
The females make flour, which is what you want to smoke or make oil from. The males produce pollen, which produces seeds in your females, which unless you're make, putting them in your granola, you know, seeds, you know, or juice or making hemp milk out of them, they're not useful to most folks, the seeds. So in the industry, we only provide female plants. In the past, for a variety of reasons, people sold unfeminized or non-feminized seed, which meant males and females. That still goes on. I don't know why, but from our company, we provide only female seed. And we have a sign, a way of doing that to guarantee that the seed that we're providing is always female. So it should say feminized on your seed and your plant should say feminized or it's a clone and a clone of a female makes a female. So that's why clones have been so popular. Um, but it is tricky. And uh, I didn't get into it at, in this workshop, but maybe we'll have a workshop in the future. We can talk about how to tell the gender of your plant, how to look for plants that are displaying male and female gender at the same time and what to do. We can talk about harvest. Um, that's a whole like own, own conversation. And I'd love to have with you guys later in the season um, as your plants get older and mature, it's easier when you have a plant to look at <laughs> and ask questions. That's great. Um, I think there's one other question too in the chat. So even in a container, would you re recommend um, a tomato cage, maybe in a container? Yeah, yeah, I would still do a trellis. If, if you have some high wind, if you would trellis a tomato plant in your container, trellis your cannabis if you've got high winds, but it can grow fine in a container without a trellis. Um, it just doesn't do well in super high winds. Like if you're on like a balcony, it gets a lot of wind. That's great. Um, I think that's, oh, uh, there's one more question. Um, last year, um, this is from Tanya, my buds had mold. So uh, she cut off as much as she could and it's still sitting. Um, is it safe to use if I missed some mold? Um, that's a great question, Tanya. Um, it's hard for me to say without like, to be completely honest, it's hard for me to say having not seen the, the flower. So first of all, cutting out the moldy bits totally happens in the industry, people do it. Um, so absolutely, if you, so I'm assuming you dried your flower, you know, you hung it somewhere to dry and then- I dried it, it, I dried it for a long time. Like a really Just long time? Yet, sorry. Yeah. Maybe tell me verbally, walk me through what you did and then maybe I can like car talk, diagnose your, your car, you know, your cannabis problem, like a I, mechanic. Well, I guess I just saw that we had really bad rain and um, I saw that some of it was starting to mold. So I cut it instantly, hung it, went back and started cutting off stuff that was very obviously mold. Then went it through the flower and started cutting and trimming uh, more of the mold and then um, put it in jars and then like sealed it and then opened it and then sealed it every couple of days. And, and I still do that. And it's pretty, pretty dry and I'm going to make a tincture or um, an oil out of it because I, I can't smoke it because I have asthma. But I just want to make sure that it's safe or should I just throw it all away? Well, thank you for that <laughs> history. That's very helpful. I will say, so first, when you notice the first signs of mold, deciding, okay, harvest is over. <laughs> cut down those right. colas, the cut down the flower and hang it to dry. Great job. The second thing would be when you dry your flour, before you package it, make sure it's super dry. Like I would say over dry your flour. Like you really want it to dry within seven to 10 days um, in a low humidity, warm and, you know, like 60 degrees less than, you know, we, we say Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, maybe it happened. Oh. Could you, um, could you repeat the last little part, Emily? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So like, oh, my internet is terrible here. I must stop the video. There we go. Okay. So basically 60 and 60. So you want to have 60 degrees and 60% or less of humidity. So in Portland, that might mean bringing it into your home in the fall, like in a garage that gets good airflow and isn't damp. 
um, or where you would dry any other herbs that you would consume. You know, if you're drying mint, you're not going to dry mint in like a musty old moldy shed, right? Same with cannabis. So Tanya, I think you did a great job drying it, but you might've packaged it too soon. You really want it to be totally dry before it gets broken down and put in a mason jar. I, you... I did, I made it over dry and it, I drew okay, uh, it in my bathroom where there's a humidifier where um, air is getting sucked out. Okay. Great. So. That's a good idea. A lot of people do dry in their bathroom like when it's not in use. Um, I would say <laughs> if you open the jar and you smell any kind of mold or visually it looks like it still has a problem, I would be concerned about using it. Um, okay. You can. Thank you. You, however, I mean, you can, if you're going to make oil from it or a tincture, it does need to be ground up. So you could grind it up and then send a sample to a testing lab. I believe it's like $35 or something or $50 to have it um, analyzed for fungus and mold. And you don't have to be a commercial grower. I can give you the information offline, um, but you could, if you really have a lot of it and you really want to use it, spending 50 bucks to have it sampled is a lot cheaper than buying it, you know, buying stuff at a store, right? So if you want to send it off to get tested, you can have it, you can legally have it tested in the same commercial lab. I have mine tested um, for fungus and mold as part of my certification. So that's also an option. But yeah, when in doubt, throw it out. Same with, you know, everything. So yeah. Yeah, please send me that information. I would I would like to have it tested. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's a great Bye resource. Um, there's a couple more questions in the chat. Um, the next one, do you know about the nutritional value of the plant parts versus the flower? Um, like if we want to juice or cook the branches and leaves during the growing season? That's a great question. Um, I don't personally know the nutritional value. I know people love to juice the leaves and do like wheatgrass shots. I know people juice the leaves as the green component in smoothies all the time. Um, I, I'm sure you could find that online, but I don't know the nutritional value, uh, but people rave about it. So hopefully it's, it's good. I think the main thing is as long as they're fresh, you know, organic, you know, not pesticide sprayed of anything, you know, just like your lettuce, um, feel free to, you know, juice your spinach, juice your cannabis. People do. People take the flour and they crumble it like oregano on their pesto, like in their, like Alfredo on their pastas. And they add, I mean, it's amazing how people are consuming the, this plant, um, to me and it's tasty like an herb. I mean, they use it like oregano. It's, it's wild. So, um, there's that, and then what was the other? Yeah, so the leaves. You really want to focus on the tender leaves. The older branches start to get kind of woody, um, but they're really vigorous growers. It's like mint, you know, the fresh new mint is like super vigorous. Just cut those parts. Cool, that is awesome. Um, and uh, another one from Rebecca. After you prune in July, can you freeze your leaves for uh, use later? Um, or must you dry and store them? The leaves, it depends what you want to do. Um, if you would freeze spinach for green smoothies, then freeze the cannabis leaves like you would spinach. I'd give them a quick blanch. Like I said, just like spinach, do a quick blanch and then pack them in your freezer so you can do them for green smoothies or juice. If you want to dry them and use them like a herb, like oregano, then dry them and, and process them that way. But people absolutely freeze um, the blanched leaves for later use. Absolutely. Amazing. Um, yeah, I think, um, we're getting close to the time. I know, um, thank you so much for, gosh, going, uh, going into all of that. Um, if anybody has any other questions, you can just come off mute, um, if you'd like to, um, that was all really amazing information. So the, so the CBD um, plants, this is Rebecca, by the way, hello. Um, for the CBD plants, um, they would also flower. So we would be using leaves and flower. Um, no? Yes? No, yeah, they're identical. Like if they're you identical. saw a marijuana plant next to a hemp plant, you it would be like, you know, 
Right. They should look okay. the same. Okay. And so the, the seeds in the um, hemp that we would get from you, there's like no THC in, or is there like the infinitesimal little bit in a hemp plant? Yeah. The legal definition of hemp is below 0.3%. Okay. So yes, if you require, I mean, that's a very low number. Um, yeah. But some people are, I mean, it's just kind of, I could talk a lot about like why that legal definition is the way it is and what, the, oh, I see your dog. Hey, dog. Oh, um, yeah, this is Lila. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, these plants have very low amounts of THC in them. So I wouldn't, I'm not, I, I wouldn't be concerned for, for like pretty much anyone um, for, for having them. Okay, awesome. That's so cool. This is such good information. Thanks. Yeah, it's just there's a lot of misinformation online. So I just feel really responsible, like trying to educate because it is a brand new plant. And like a lot of things we talked about today, you can't go to new seasons and buy leaves, you know, to juice. Um, so for people who use it as part of their wellness routine, unless they grow it themselves or call me, I have some chefs that, that um, chefs like purchase material from me for their like edibles and things because they can't grow enough um, or they live somewhere they can't grow. So I send them foliage, but unless you know, like I'm one of the, I'm like the only, I've never heard of any, you know what I mean? Like, and people just don't have access. So it's really unfortunate. Um, like one thing we talk about as I have actually a flower arrangement right here, you can totally do flower arranging with it. It's a really fantastic green. It's super versatile. It does great in the vase. It looks, normal, you know what I mean? It's a real fluffy plant. So I love growing it for flower arranging because I tend to only grow flowers and never grow foliage. But then I walk over to the nursery and I prune back some of my plants for, for work and then I have an instant, you know, greenery. So um, I think it's a great plant just as an ornamental, you know, I'm not really in, I, I don't smoke things. I'm not, I can't have any THC personally. Um, and I like it just as a gardener. It's a cool plant. It gets big and fluffy. You can eat it, you can juice it, you can smoke it. Your friends always want some of it. You know what I mean? You can always like give it to people like, wow, you know? So it's like the best herb vegetable ever, you know, for that, for those reasons. So it's really versatile and it does grow like a weed. It's really hard to kill. I mean, it really does. It's not a joke. I mean, it's a joke, but it does grow like a weed. So uh, it's a very rewarding plant for a gardener. So, yeah, that's awesome. It's such a magical plant for so, for myriad reasons. It really truly is. Yeah. Yep. Well, I look yep. forward to getting you all seeds and plants hopefully really soon. So we yeah. can start seeing and remember to share your photos with Gabby or with us directly and um, can't wait to see how everyone does this year. Yeah, thank you so much for um, giving us your time and all your expertise. And um, well, and we'd love, I'm sure we'd love to have you back um, as the season continues. So like, um, you know, maybe something with pruning and then something with um, harvesting later in the year, that would be so amazing. Um, and we can all see each other again. <laughs> thank you so, so much. Um, yeah, thank you for having me, Gabby. See you guys all through the Thanks. Have a good Sunday, everybody. Bye. Bye.